say hello to the big, beautiful world. This is the Summer Morning Buzz, Monday edition. I should introduce myself. I am your host, Kyle Pepitone, joined with my co-host, Petrina Geiger, and our newscaster, Crystal Santos. Crystal, what is going on in the world today? Good morning. Uh, <laughs> I know we've been one year into the Zoom whole thing, but I still can't get it right, as you yeah. can see. But, <laughs> it's a but learning any- process still. A- absolutely. But anyway, there's a lot of things going on in the world. In Hawthorne, New Jersey, a truck overturned after crashing on Monday morning, splitting 30 gallons of hydraulic fuel and damaging an NJ, NJ Transit rail bridge. According to NorthJersey.com, the driver, who was the only person in the truck, was transported to a local hospital. The Biden administration has dismantled and replaced a U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office created during the Trump presidency that helps victims of crimes committed by immigrants. According to Fox News, former President Trump launched VOICE, which stands for Victims of Immigration's Crime Engagement Office, and an executive order during his first week in office in 2017. British scientists have urged Prime Minister Boris Johnson to err on the side of caution and postpone plans to lift most coronavirus restrictions. According to AP News, the rising infections caused by the Delta variant is estimated by some to be at least 60% more contagious than the previous dominant strain. It is now time for your morning weather update. It is currently 64 degrees, and as Kyle said, it is raining. And we are looking today at a high of 73 degrees. Tomorrow, we are looking at another rainy day with a high of 77 degrees and a low of 63 degrees. You can't escape the rain, Kyle. No, I'm not looking forward to the next, well, the next hour will be fine. After that, (laughs) I'm going to have to walk back. Tired of Uh the rain. Uh, At least I'll have the heat in my car at that point. But thank you, Crystal. And we also have... Uh, a pre-recorded segment of that our news team talk about the Jersey Devil, the new Hi everyone, my name is Louis Biancalillo, your news director here at 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Recently, a team and I took a trip down to Six Flags Great Adventure to test out their newest and most insane roller coaster called Jersey Devil Coaster. Not only did we get to test out the ride, which, by the way, was a real good time, we also had the opportunity to catch up with the marketing and public relations manager at Six Flags, Kristen Fitzgerald. She gave us the inside scoop on the park's newest coaster. Jersey Devil Coaster is the world's tallest, fastest, and longest single rail coaster. And what makes it so unique is that it's like a monorail that you're riding single file and really low, straddling the track. It's a really unique feeling and the perfect addition at Six Flags Great Adventure. So you're telling me there's nobody to the left or to the right of you? That is correct. You are single file. There is no one's hand to hold. You are all by yourself. Um, it also makes it more thrilling, I think. You know, the fact that you're, you're just really out there on your own. Tell me about the name Jersey Devil. Why that? Six Flags has been trying to name a ride after our wonderful mythology of the Jersey Devil really the entire time we've been in existence, so more than 40 years, but we knew it had to be the right ride. And we love Jersey Devil mythology because it actually ties to the Pine Barrens and we are located right on the edge of the Pine Barrens. Um, And the story is, is pretty well known for New Jerseyans and I think we're introducing this really cool folklore to the world. And have you been on the ride? I have. What what do you think? I think it's amazing. It's definitely a different feeling from any other kind of coaster that I've ever been on. Um, Unexpected. And my absolute favorite element is the 180 degree stall. Riding that is, I mean, it's just, it's it's almost like weird. (laughs) It's a weird feeling to be sort of suspended upside down while you're riding this giant hill. It seems like you're defying gravity. You shouldn't be doing that, but it's super fun. And you guys are having media uh, a media preview today, but we're also having season pass and membership previews. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yes. So tonight, after media preview, we'll open it up for members and season pass holders. And Friday and Saturday as well will be our members and season pass holders. And then we will open to the public appropriately on the 13th on Sunday. We're keeping with our lucky 13s of the Jersey Devil, 13 stories tall, 13th coaster. He was the 13th child of Mother Leeds, and we will open on June 13th. Awesome. And any word, will this ride be open for Holiday in the Park this year? That is the plan. 
Yes. So this is the section that is open for Holiday in the Park and all indications are that this ride can run in the cold, so we are crossing our fingers that it will be open for Holiday in the Park. Well, fantastic. And I know it's not only the roller coaster you guys are opening. You also have a nice little food stand. Can you tell me a little bit about what we can expect there? Because after I get off the ride, I'm going to be hungry. Fantastic. Yes, we are opening Jersey Devil Barbecue. Um, just kind of pull some flames in there from the Jersey Devil. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to showcase a lot of different kinds of foods that are not available in other parts of the park. Um, pulled pork, jambalaya, brisket, um, mac and cheese. There's a lot of really unique flavors there. Lots of barbecue sauce, which I absolutely love. I think I could drown myself in barbecue sauce. <laughs> that sounds delicious. And just one last question. I know some people are still a little bit afraid to come out to amusement parks uh, com coming out of COVID. What safety things are going on here at the park? How can people feel comfortable coming back to Six Flags? You know, from the very beginning, Six, Six Flags has always followed the direction of the CDC, along with our own local government, state government. And when we reopened last year, we had an incredible, uh, very in-depth new protocol that it involved masks and temp taking and social distancing and hand washing. And some people think that all of that has gone away just because we're now uh, able to not wear masks in the park. But those who are vaccinated are allowed to wear masks. And we encourage people who are not vaccinated to still wear a mask. I mean, that is still um, advice that the CDC is giving and us as well. Um, and people should still social distance, wash those hands. We still have our hand sanitizer located throughout the park. Um, and we're still doing all of our great new technologies that we introduced during COVID. Touchless bag checking, the mobile dining, um, all kinds of new technologies that made our operation more efficient, not just safer during COVID. So those things are going to stay. Our guests love them and they will stay long after COVID is behind us. Fantastic. And last question, and our listeners know that I'm a roller coaster junkie. I talk about you guys all the time on my show. Um, front row or back row on this ride? That is the question. Wow. They are two totally different experiences. Um, I think you have to do both. I don't want to hedge, but I feel like you have to do both because the front is just such an incredible unencumbered view. And when you're on that single rail riding low and so close to the track, it's kind of nothing like it. But the back is the slingshot. You know, it's just so intense in the back. Um, so I say if you're a coaster enthusiast, you really need to do both. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. After the interview, we had a chance to get actually on the ride. And it's really something that we've never experienced before. There's no one sitting on the left of you, no one sitting on the right of you. You can put your hands not only up in the air, if you're a thrill seeker, but you can put them out to the side. And I think that's probably the coolest part of this new, this new ride, Jersey Devil Coaster. Jersey Devil Coaster opens to the public on Sunday, June 13th, 2021. If you want your chance to take on the Jersey Devil Coaster, you can head on down to Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey. They're open daily, and our team really, really loved the ride. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. Oh my god, yeah, especially the where the you no one's to the side of you, so it's like yeah, you're that, just that's there alone. I know. <laughs> I mean, that see that's weird because like I have not been to Six Flags in a long time because I used to work there, and you know when you work at a place, it kind of ruins the fun of being there as a customer, so to speak. But I have not been there in a while, so I haven't tried out at least two years worth of new rides. But I never really go alone. So I'm very interested in like how long a line would, how long the wait would be. Cause now you're not sitting with the person you went to the park with. Let's say you come with four people. That's four rows taken up now. Right. I don't know if there's, there's probably less seats then. Right. Cause if there's like, you know, I don't know. I never, I don't like roller coasters, so oh. I don't go on them. I'm very sorry. <laughs> But I, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's just there's less people on the ride now since it's like, you know, there's only one person per row. Yeah, I was think I was either thinking less seats and more carts per se, so like less 
less links of a single ride, but more of them or just more in a single one to accommodate to more people. I don't know the semantics of like ride queues and how they work. So I can't really say which one would make it go faster, but I don't know. I guess I'll have to go and find out myself. I'm with Patrina yeah. on this one. I don't like rides and if, it's a no for me, first of all, because if I can't hold someone's hand, I know I already have like a mini anxiety attack every single time I go on a ride. And it's, it's funny because my friend literally just texted me like 30 minutes ago and she asked me like, let's go to Six Flags. And I was like, ah, I'm not really feeling it because rides are not my thing. So if I can't hold anybody's hand, mm, count me out. Well, it's there no goes my me. proposed summer Monday morning buzz trip. <laughs> so sorry, Kyle. <laughs> I'm heartbroken. But in terms of the stories we have for you today, as both COVID cases and vaccination rates decline, larger areas or areas that are, have the lower vaccine rates are still at risk. So despite the vaccination rates dropping all over the country, the United States is seeing a decrease in COVID cases. And we've seen this in the last few weeks in New Jersey, too. We are uh, confirming less and less new cases uh, on a weekly basis. But according to John Hopkins University, the nation has decreased from a weekly average of around 21,000 cases in late May to just over 14,000 cases average this week. Additionally, states have slowly been lifting many of the restrictions that were put into place at the beginning of the pandemic. Experts say that they saw a national experts say that they saw a natural spreading of the areas that saw a natural spreading of the virus are now seeing increased immunity rates. Mississippi State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs believes that about 60% of Mississippi residents have some kind of underlying immunity to COVID, either due to vaccination or actual exposure to the virus itself. Medical experts attribute a variety of reasons to the drop in cases in the U.S., uh, mainly since it's June. Uh, we're talking higher temperatures, people spending less time inside, and like I mentioned before, uh, exposure to the virus and or the vaccine itself. And for NJ numbers, this week we've confirmed 183 new cases, three additional deaths, and nine. we are in the ninth consecutive day in a row in which we've confirmed less than 300 cases in a day. And 63% of the state's adults have been fully vaccinated, with officials trying to get that to 70% by the end of the month. So I know we're not out of this yet, but the numbers are looking pretty good. We're slowly right. getting there. But like they said, medical experts have said, we're also in summer months. And this is kind of what you see um, virus or bacterial wise pretty much every uh, year around this time. I think the real test is going to be, and I'm no medical expert, but I think the real seeing how effective everything has been is not going to, we're going to have to wait until September, October when that flu season hits before we can see how effective all these protocols really were. And if we jump the gun on releasing or uh, like dropping all of these mandates. Right. Yeah. I mean, also when I was looking at, um, they want to get to 70% by the end of June, I feel like since 63% of the of people or adults have been vaccinated already in New Jersey, I feel like since it's slowly, like the vaccination rates are slowly going up now rather than like really quickly. Right. I feel like that goal isn't really going to be reached by the end of June. I want to say by like mid summer, like sometime between like mid July to like early August. I'm yeah. Guessing. I think that's a better like range. Cause we've got like, I forget how many days are in June. The, the 30 right. 31 thing always throws me off but we have uh, according to my quick math 16 days left in june and each week we're seeing more and more that oh the numbers the vaccination rates are stagnating or are on the decline so right. it's going slower and slower week by week so you're right i don't think we'll see this by the end of june like they're hoping for but i think fairly soon we'll see at least to 70% yeah, right. I mean, now that it's summer, I feel like people are like more comfortable with going out the warm weather right. and, you know, it's not as like, it's not a flu season. So it's not like, or like, it's not really allergy season anymore. I don't know how, how people are with like the summer, like the month of June. 
Right. But yeah, um, to my knowledge, I've never had allergies, so I don't know when allergy season is. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I get allergies once in a while, but I don't think that like for me, June, I don't really get allergies. And I feel like a lot of people don't really. Right. There are some people that do, but I feel like it's more like of the month of May or April. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like maybe maybe more towards July or maybe and sometime around in July. Yeah. And what you were saying before, like how people are less or are more relaxed to like go out and start doing things this year. Uh, or this summer, I mean, now that summer's hit. Uh, it's very weird because that's every summer people love to go out and do things. And I think we're seeing a difference between this summer and last summer. Because you put it like people are more comfortable with doing things and going to do activities, which is a very hopeful thing this year. Last year, I feel like that very same thing was seen as a concern. Because we were yeah. still in the early stages of it. And we're like, summer's hitting. People aren't going to want to stay inside. Because we were in, we've been in lockdown for about two months by the time June hit last year. So if we knew it was a year, I think we could all dealt with the two months. But we, we were think everyone was thinking like, well, a majority of people aren't going to want to be stuck in their house all summer on top of the additional two months that we just had. They're going to start going out and we're going to see a whole resurgence in things. And th it was a main concern summertime last year. And now this year, it, uh, it, it feels like it has a more hopeful vibe. Like, oh, yes, people are more comfortable to go out. This is great. We're finally getting back to our normal. And in the wake of all the mandates being dropped, I think we can see that normal coming back very soon with a few yeah. tweaks here and there. I'm laughing, Kyle, because you said that people are more comfortable um, of going out, but I think it's more like people are just fed up of being inside and being like that was being probably better wording, yeah, <laughs> not being true. able That's to true. to go. And I think it's interesting that you, like, at least what you said, that more as the days get warmer and nicer, pe more people want to go outside, and because they're outdoors, the rates are like slowly but surely declining. Right. And people are getting vaccinated, which, of course, helps. But honestly, if it were to, up to me, like the way I was thinking that, if anything, right now during the summer is where the cases were rise. Because, and I say this because, you know, there's a whole bunch of people in groups of people like I myself right. have been in that are like mingling and no masks and, you know, just casually talking, like close to each other, not socially distancing. That is so, true. So I, to be honest, I thought that if anything, cases were going to go up. And I mean, I don't want to jinx it. Hopefully not. Only, you know, we're, we're heading in the right direction and it just goes better and better yeah. each day as we move forward. But that was just something interesting that I thought of because, you know, more people are going out. Um, but hey. Yeah, you do bring up a good point. I mean, even around this time, we're, t we're talking like early, mid-June there's a whole number of people graduating birthday parties, all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. granted, like in my neighborhood, uh, the ones I've seen have been held outside. Obviously I wouldn't see the ones being held inside, but the graduation parties I've seen were being held mainly outside. So that might be a contributing factor to why it's not going up as much as we would expect it to in a time like this. But that is a very good uh, observation that like, oh, more people are together when in cases go on the rise. But according to John Hopkins, uh, no, which is I mean, it definitely has good. to be the, vac the vaccines. Yeah, it definitely yeah. has to be the vaccines because, you know, it builds up your resistance to, you know, contracting COVID. But right. Um, that and actual exposure to COVID itself. Mm -hmm. Those are like right. the two main factors people uh, experts say um, right. are contributing to these decreasing cases which fingers crossed they stay this way like going onward because this very soon i believe and this is me believing it and nobody else no station influence or anything but i believe that very soon this is going to become very similar to the flu or the common cold we're never getting rid of covid completely i want to point that out that i can say for a fact because you really can't get rid of a disease completely like you can't completely eradicate a disease at least to my knowledge so very soon i think we're going to see it just evolve into something that's not fun to get but can be easily treated 
And we're yeah. kind of seeing that now. And I hope we're in that phase, that transition period right now, in which it's no longer the massive threat it was last year. It still exists, but we can fight it now. Fight it much easier than we could 12 months ago. Yeah. Um, I will- I- Go ahead, Patricia. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I was gonna say, I was just gonna say that uh, Kyle, I agree with you. I was, I actually had the same. I felt the same way about like how COVID eventually it's gonna like be like the flu, where it's like you gotta get your vaccines like every right. year, and um, it's just like it's gonna be like some like some sort of like disease you're gonna like you could get, but it's not like as likely as it used to be. You know, so exactly. But I mean, personally, I do like I do feel more comfortable going out this summer because I mean, numbers are lower and um, because of the vaccine. And like, I feel like um, I don't know. I feel like people still are following protocols. I mean, people that are like, you know, like I there are people that aren't, but there are a lot of people that are. So, I mean, I feel like since we're used to it, it's kind of like, I don't know. And I'm still like personally, I'm still wearing my mask around and so that helps a little bit for myself so right. well i i mean yeah but like a, a lot of protocols especially in jersey have been dropped because i know uh murphy took away the mask mandate um not for everyone technically it's only for those vaccinated but he also said they're not going to check so you know you're going to see a couple bit of liars come out um yeah. And then I believe recently he got rid of like all the indoor restrictions, right? Like the limited capacity things. Right. Yeah. I mean, actually, funny story. Yesterday I went to Applebee's. And so usually when you go there or like any restaurant, they have like a table open and a table closed. It's like every other table is open. But um, in this in the case when I went yesterday, it was like every table was filled. And I was like, oh, wow, like this is this is actually like happening. You know, <laughs> like I was like very I was like, oh, wow. Like it's something you got to get used to all over again. Exactly. Really I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> we need an adjustment period to go back to 2019 living. Yeah, I know. It's crazy how, like, it was, like, at one point we were, like, have to get used to all these, like, COVID protocols. And now we just got to get used to, like, the normal protocols again or whatever. <laughs> you know? It's so funny. It's, it's, at, it's like, it's literally, like, out of this, well, not literally out of this world. But speaking of something that is literally out of this world, Katrina. That was good. Okay. $28 million is winning bid for Sea Aboard Blue Origin's first human space flight. $28 million is the winning bid for a seat aboard by a civilian in the New Shepard while when Jeff Bezos' space tourism venture, Blue Origin, flies people to space for the first time next month. On Saturday, the live auction lasted under 10 minutes, opening at $4.9 million with over 20 bidders calling in. Saturday's live auction follows five weeks of online bidding, according to Blue Origin. By the time registration closed Thursday for the live auction, nearly 7,600 people from 159 countries registered to bid for a seat aboard the flight on June 20th. Pre-auction bidding ended up at $4.8 million. Ahead of the auction, Ariane Cornell, Blue Origins Director of Astronaut and Orbital Sales, said, quote, the name of the winners won't be announced immediately because the company needs to complete some final paperwork with them. Mark and Jeff Bezos will be on the flight as well, which was announced by the company earlier this week. The fourth and final crew member will be announced after the winner. Uh, this this is the opportunity to fly above the Carmen line, the intentionally recognized line of space at over 300,000 feet or 62 miles, which presents a new market opportunity in space tourism, the company said. With only 569 people have ever been over the Carmen line, according to Cornell. The experience will last for 11 minutes and the astronauts will be able to unbuckle their seatbelts and float in zero gravity for about three minutes. What do you guys think about this? Okay. So first, when I was first reading the story, I thought they were going, well, they are going to space, but I thought they were talking like a trip to space, like several weeks landing on some foreign, not planet or like, like the moon or something like they were going for a while. (laughs) And so I, 
I'll admit I was a little disappointed when I learned it was an only an 11 minute trip, but still it's crazy to think about. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Like I, like you said, I, I, I honestly thought it was like, oh, they're going to space for maybe like a week, a day, a few days, whatever. Exactly. But 11 minutes. I mean, honestly, I, I'm not as surprised. I mean, it is like, I don't know. I feel like it's not like, obviously it's not every day that somebody can get this opportunity, but it's just so much money for 11 minutes. I mean, yes, it would. If you are the winner, it's probably going to be the coolest thing in the world when you go in a little bit over a month. So the, what did you say? It was July 20th, correct? Yeah. Is the flight. So Mm -hmm. I don't know how I would feel doing that. I'm sure the initial anxiety from it is probably overwhelming. You're literally going to above what everybody recognizes as pretty much the end of the earth and the start of space where there is no oxygen. I yeah. cannot wrap, I could not wrap my head around doing something like that. Oh, I know. I mean, it's like, I don't know. I feel like it'd be really cool. I just wouldn't spend that much money on it, especially for that short of the time. Oh, well, obviously, yes. That's, yeah, I, if I don't even like, have that kind of money to spend. Oh, I know. I mean, it's I don't just, think I have half. <laughs> half is a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! But I just—I don't know. I just think it's—it is pretty cool how like somebody is able to experience that. Somebody with that money. But I mean, it's—it is something that's a good a good opportunity for people. It's always oh. that. Oh, it's always the one person who has opportunities that you know, regular casual people like myself. All right, don't get an opportunity to. But I will agree with you, Pacino, that I think it's super cool because obviously right now we're, I think, very focused on the amount of money and for just 11 minutes because, quite frankly, it is an absurd amount of money. But if you have double of that amount of money and you are just looking to what you want to spend it, this is definitely, definitely worth it. And I say this because, again, not every day any normal person gets to just get up on you know yes but i don't know if we can say it's worth it having no experience with it i would we could say we would think it's worth it Mm -hmm. but like okay let's be honest here i mean i can't imagine this not being i can't imagine this not being not cool (laughs) that grammatically correct (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Like, I feel like you would like as of right now, if, you, if you're thinking about it, you're like, oh, that's a really cool experience. Like, I would so do that. But then again, like, what if you get on and you're just like, what? This isn't like anything I expected. And it's like more lame than what you would have thought. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it does have the potential to be over hyped, per se. Like, oh, my goodness, you're going to space. But then you get up there and like it said, it's an 11 minute trip. You only get to float in zero gravity for about three minutes, which I'm sure for a normal person, like anybody who spend 20 plus years on the ground would be more than enough time to do somersaults or whatnot. But it does have that potential to be like, oh, it wasn't as great as I thought it would be. Kyle, don't say that, Kyle. I'm sorry. I'm a Debbie Downer. Yes, I see that. I see that, Kyle. But no, because I said it it would be a great experience because, well, at least for me, let me speak for myself. I think, of course, I've never been, so I wouldn't know. Kyle's very right on that. He's he's speaking (laughs) facts. But I will say that for me, at least every single time I try new things, it's about, like, the experience for me. Like, the build-up, the beginning, the middle, and the end. Like, it's the whole experience for me. Which is why I thought it was, I, I said it was pretty cool because, um, according to the article, there was how many? 20 bidders calling in. So that one person got it instead of those other 19 people. Yes, I can't afford it, but those other 19 people could. They just, you know, they... They capped out uh, where they were yeah. willing to bid for it. But, you know, like, I'm sure they were just as intrigued, just as excited to go on this. So, Kyle, I know you're a Debbie Downer over sorry, there. But... I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, but I, I think this is very interesting. I think this particular thing, uh, this first 
what was it? It was the first flight. Yes, the first human space flight from Blue Origin. I think this is a stepping stone into bigger things. I think in the future now, we are going to see, we could have the potential to see more of this on a grander scale. Because this is only four people going up in this particular trip. Uh, Jeff Bezos, his brother Mark, uh, undisclosed winner number one, and undisclosed fourth crewmate. So it's ve- it's a very good starting point if that's what their plan is to like, okay, this is what we can do. How do we make it bigger and better and encompass more people? Because like, it's a very short flight and it's a very, I'm sure it's very, very costly to do anything, even, a, even an 11 minute flight probably cost more money than bigger than a number that I can actually count to. But I I think this is a stepping stone. I think they're trying this out, seeing like, okay, this is where our technology is. This is how many people we can account for. This is what we can do with what we have. Let's develop that further. And I think in the coming years, we can see, oh, Blue 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 Origins, second human spaceflight can accommodate eight people this time, and then 16, and then 32, and then 64. And then 128, you get the point. Right. <laughs> no, I, yeah, but like that's 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 a, that's a good point. I'm sure they're like testing it out and I'm sure like maybe in the future they'll be able to have people last longer. Maybe there's a reason why they only have it for such a short amount of time right. for like safety precautions, whatever. But like Crystal said, like the, the experience, you're right. Like the experience is like, like so thrilling, like being able, I bet even like calling in to bid is like, like an experience you know and then winning it and then all that like building up to like that moment to when you get to get on it and then you're going up you know what i mean yeah but even i mean even though (laughs) the flight's the same amount of time as like my breaks at work i mean it's (laughs) it's worth i'm sure i'm sure it's a great experience yeah (laughs) and like i i think a main and this is all i'm gonna say on this this is the last thing i'm gonna say on this but i think the main reason it's um so short is because not just anybody can go into space just like that. You need, I'm pretty, from what I remember or understand, there is very rigorous training you need to go through to like stay in space. So like if they took this trip for like, like we said, like a week or a couple of days, you would have to go through a very rigorous training process from what I understand before you can do something like that. Sure. Because think about it, you're in an enclosed space in just nothingness for an extended period of time that you would need something to prepare yourself for that. Kayo, let the rich live rich, okay? (laughs) I'm just saying, I'm just saying, (laughs) but back here on Earth, specifically in New Jersey, uh, cops in Hopewell are wearing pride patches for the rest of Pride Month, uh, being June. So in Hopewell, New Jersey, Alex Mira has been sewing pride patches onto uniforms of her fellow police officers. Officers in Hopewell are volunteering to wear these patches for the remainder of the month, like I said. Mira, who came up with the idea, stated, quote, I am fairly certain we are the first to wear wear a pride flag on our uniform, end quote. So Alexis Mira is a detective as part of the Hopewell Police Department, and she came up with these patches in an effort to help uh, Trihad House, which is an LGBTQ plus friendly group home for teens and young adults in Ewing, New Jersey. So patches for police officers are um, a thing that's all around. They have, they collect them, they trade them, and they even sell them to the general public. So like uh, certain police stations, like this one in Hopewell, you would go in and there'd be a, a board on the wall full of different patches. And so um, this detective, uh, Mira, decided that for Pride Month, uh, she would help design and sew on patches to her fellow officers. And they are selling them to the general public as well. And all the proceeds that are raised by selling these patches are going toward the Trihat House, which is the LGBTQ house, uh, because she contacted them and she believed in their mission and she wanted to help them out. And, you know, I just think that's a very, like, cool thing to do. Like, not only that, but they're also the first group in New uh, first precinct in New Jersey to do this. 
And so I think if word gets out, like they're spreading this and they're selling them and stuff. And I think if word gets out, we can see more uh, police departments, not just in Jersey, but across the country doing things like this. Maybe next month it'll be not a requirement, but it'll be something that's done in all 50 states. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I would think that's so cool. Like being a part, I guess, somebody who's a part of the LGBTQ community. Like, I think it's like, it's very heartwarming, you know, to like see that and like, like hopefully it's a step forward to like something great, you know? Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Crystal, what do you think? I think it's great. It's like what you said in the name of inclusivity, it just shows that I guess because we are in pride month, it's like, we, you know, we believe in you or we're with you, we're allies type of thing. However, I will say that going off on your point, Kyle, of saying that, you know, this can be a starting point for what other precincts or other states do. Right. I think that obviously there will be some people who are like, no. And maybe maybe everybody wants to wear one, right? But the way right. this world is set up, I think I can confidently say that there will be, you know, police officers who won't want to do that and just right. for religious reasons or whatever the case may be and I think it'll it'll be like another issue where you know then those individuals who don't choose not to patch have that patch are going to be like singled out so I don't think it will um, become a requirement it'll definitely I think become an option but I don't yeah. think it'll be a requirement because I know someone somewhere will will have an issue with, you know, making it a requirement. But like you said, it's a great starting point, great initiative in the, yeah. like, in the name of inclusivity. Yeah, and it, yeah. it is voluntary. So like all the officers in Hopewell who are choosing to do this are volunteering to do it. So it's not like they're required, like you said, they're not required to do it, but it's still a very nice thing to see. And, you know, I don't think it would ever become or will ever become like a requirement just because like you said, there might be some people who have a problem with it. It might go against what somebody believes in. I don't want to get into that, but just to see it available across the country would be a very cool thing to see. Like having that option in any, like for police to have that option, no matter which police, uh, which state police you look at. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It definitely won't become a requirement, but I think that it's definitely going to cause some controversy controversy but i think it's i think it's you know it's something good that you know to spread that like awareness and yeah. have people you know show that they're supporting the community yeah exactly and i and think especially the officers right. yeah and i i just wanted to say i think you see a lot of that right now especially in this year with everything going on and you know racial justice and just trying to be inclusive and an ally to everyone. I think you're, well, at least for me, uh, I'm seeing a lot of like commercials or before it used to be like, obviously we used to look for the um, pride parade in New York city and, and everywhere else that would occur. But, and it would be like stores will have their lines with the rainbow flag, rainbow right. colors, etc. But I think now we are really looking at like commercials that bring attention. Like the other day I was watching a show on Hulu and I saw this ad from Indeed that was basically um, I guess bringing awareness on what pronouns to use for someone who you know is non-binary oh, okay. so I thought it, yeah so I thought it was pretty cool because you know now they're they're having these ads like I had well at least for myself I'd never seen an ad like that before so I thought it was pretty yeah. cool and I think a lot of people in general are just trying to promote more awareness and you know educating other people so yeah right. definitely yeah especially um like clothing stores even like you know target or american eagle stores like that they have like pride merch like they like you know ha have their like clothing have like the rainbows and all that and it's really cool i mean there's some i feel like there are some companies um that will take advantage of that kind of like of this month and will kind of they, they're trying to show awareness, but I feel like it's more about like sales and trying to get people to buy PR. this pride merch. Yep. Rather than like having it to be like what it's really about and have right. it have a meaning to it. Yeah, definitely. But and, you know, it's, it is, it's how the world is and hopefully yeah. it'll evolve to something better and people use it as something like with a meaning rather than just like using it to 
have sales, get sales. Right. Yeah. But with that being said, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have a modern day retelling of the story of Jonah. Kind of. Stay tuned. You are listening to 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair, where music stays cool. Cooler than Link on a Quest. Hey, listen. And welcome back to the Summer Morning Buzz, the Monday edition. I am Kyle Pepitone, joined here with Petrina Geiger and Crystal Santos. And I have to ask you, do you guys remember that scene in Finding Nemo where Marlin and Dory are swallowed by the whale? Barely. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Barely? That's Barely. like the one scene from the movie I remember. That was like my favorite scene as a kid. But... Could you imagine that happening to you in real life? Nope. Absolutely not. Well, well, not to you specifically, but it has this past week. Michael Packard, a 56-year-old lobster diver, found himself in the mouth of a humpback whale off of Provincetown, Massachusetts. Packard said he was diving about 45 feet or 14 meters deep when he felt something bump into him before everything went dark. Initially, he thought he was the victim of a shark attack, but then said, quote, then I realized, oh my, I'm in a whale's mouth and he's trying to swallow me. And I thought to myself, okay, this is it. I'm finally, I'm going to die, end quote. However, it wasn't too long before the whale surfaced and spat out the diver who was rescued by one of his crewmates roughly 30 seconds after this whole thing took place. Whale expert Charles Mayo said that these kind of interactions are rare as humpback whales are typically non-aggressive. He states that this was most likely an accident while the whale was feeding on fish. So, you know, first off, good for the whale for admitting his mistake and spitting out the diver. <laughs> but on the other hand, oh my, I forget going to space. This is the most terrifying thing I've ever heard. I agree. Patrina, I think you're a mute. Um, but I agree because um, I'm, I'm so happy he had a crew with him because had it not been for the crew, he would have been in there. And I cannot even imagine dying like that. I can't even. No. Yeah. Well, luckily, the whale spat him out to begin with. So, like, he wasn't he it was like 30 seconds between being swallowed and being spat out and he was just picked up by his crew. So yes, the crew definitely did help, but I don't think from what I read from the story, I don't think the crew actually got him out of the whale. Physically. Uh, uh, I think, see? I think oh, sorry. like the, go ahead. What sorry. <laughs> no, what were you saying? Kyle? No, no, no. I was saying, go ahead. I kept interrupting you though. <laughs> All good. But, um, I just can't imagine the emotions he felt in those 30 seconds, like thinking like, like, thinking you're going to die and like, where are you? And like, how is this happening? And all of a sudden you get spit back out and then yeah. here you are, you're, you're back and you're alive and you're like, what the heck was that? You know? Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. That's crazy. And it's even scarier because I am going to Cape Cod this summer. <laughs> and that's, that's exactly where it happened. Right. In that area. Uh, Massachusetts so like, okay. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Provincetown. Yeah. I'm right. going somewhere over there, but even so that's like, that's very scary. <laughs> I, I I think you'll be fine. As long as you stay at like 44 feet deep, you'll be fine. Oh, okay. okay. If you go yeah. 45, <laughs> that's when trouble starts coming. Right, right. Okay. I'll make sure when I go diving. <laughs> I mean, just overall, just, I, I'm, okay. So when I first, I, um, our general manager, Annabella sent this to us. And she said, hey, you guys should cover this tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, let me check it out. And then I read, diver swallowed by whale and then spat back out. I'm like, I need a moment to process this. Because <laughs> I'm one of those people who like put themselves in other shoes a lot. Or like throw myself into the most unlikely of scenarios. And this, along with the plane crash we talked about, like that, uh, that emergency landing that guy had to make. Um, either a week ago or two weeks ago. There's a lot of these instances that 20 years of life have never prepared me to react for. How am I supposed to react? 30 seconds or not, being in the stomach 
of a whale. I would have started freaking out. Yeah, freaking it's out. Probably, probably a good idea. Probably a good uh, <laughs> or natural response most people would have. Yeah, I, I can't. No, I really just can't picture like just you know diving all of a sudden. You're like, oh. I'm in a whale. Like, that's just so crazy. And like, I'm the same as you, Kyle. Like I'm somebody who pictures myself in somebody else's shoes. And so it's like thinking about it. I'm like, oh my God, that's freaky. Like, it's just. Yeah. Mm -mm. And just for reference, a humpback whale can range anywhere from 43 feet to 52 feet in length. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. And, and the diver said he had about 20 feet of visibility maybe so you don't even have any time to react to like regardless if it was coming up from behind him or coming from in front of him you have no time to react because yeah like yeah go ahead. how would you even react sorry i was gonna say how do you even react in that situation like you're like if you're right you're in the whale's mouth and you're like there and it's like how what am i do now what do i do now like do i sit here do i start trying to find a way out like exactly. it's just who knows like you don't know what to do right probably smelled in there too Ugh. oh great yeah <laughs> i mean i'm sure i i wouldn't try sniffing underwater but i mean yeah he's still he, so he kept breathing because he still had his breathing apparatus attached but what are your options at that point like what what do you think like what could you possibly think to do like there's nothing around you that you can use to escape it's literally a mouth of a whale you have teeth and a tongue maybe i don't know the anatomy of a whale but i figure i figure there's not something very useful there's no escape hatch in the belly of a whale yeah so i wouldn't think so <laughs> yeah and as my mother always says Never trust the water and never trust anything. It's in the water. Thank you very much. Thanks oh. for coming to my PSA. Yeah, <laughs> no, the, the ocean, <laughs> the ocean is probably the scariest place. We know nothing about it. And I, I was just thinking about this regard. I don't care what animal it is. If you're, if you've got 20 feet of visibility at the most and you see anything coming towards you, I'm out. Go the other way. Yeah. Go the other way. <laughs> the other way or side to side, maybe just, I don't know. I, I would panic. I would panic. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, like most of us would, I'm assuming. But like, I don't know. I'm just the motion's just scary. Like we were talking about space earlier. And like, I, it, we know more, like, as like, as we know, now we know more about space than we do about the ocean. So it's, it's just, that's crazy to think about, because we know more so about something that's not on this planet more than something that isn't or is i meant yeah. or whatever i said yeah there's okay. two realms of just vast emptiness that we know of the ocean and space and we're just here <laughs> in the middle ground just like hey we got birds and stuff who knows <laughs> what's down there who knows what's up there it's too much for me to think about right <laughs> but aside from this being so shocking i think it's i'm i'm impressed you know that he survived. He he was he he was he survived. So I just think like wow, he's some lucky diver because yeah. I don't think everybody that I don't think this is the first time that it's happened. Uh, maybe, but I don't think so. And but it's probably the first time. I mean, I don't know this with certainty, but maybe it's like the first time where someone can you know talk about their experience, yeah. which is mind-blowing and he came out relatively unharmed too he said he only had like br a bruised or broken leg i forget specifically what it was but to not only survive that but to come out in pretty decent shape is nothing short of a miracle and i should preface because i was also reading about this this exact this same man also survived a plane crash uh about 20 years ago in november of tw uh, 2001 so i mean this man, this man is like the luckiest man alive right now. I would buy yeah. a lotto ticket if I if I was him. Yeah, he he's made a steal. I mean, <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know that I I think I said this last time, but there was this like, I think it was like a meme or like a TikTok video that was talking about how if you've gone through the whole pandemic and have not had COVID, 
you were one of God's favorite. Like that's what they were claiming. And it was like, it went viral because it was funny. Right. And, and it, it was basically worded like, how does it feel to be God's favorite? <laughs> so <laughs> and throughout this whole story, I have just been thinking like, yeah, Michael Park, Parkin, what does it feel to be God's one of God's favorites? So yeah. the, it's, it's like funny, you know, like I know whatever your religious beliefs may be, but I just think it was funny because it's like it's a, it's amazing that he made it out and he survived this. And now you're telling me 20 years ago he was in a plane crash. That man is lucky. Yeah, and the worst thing that happened to me today is I got stuck in the rain. <laughs> yeah. You clearly but- don't have your your no. issues, right, Kyle? No, I don't. <laughs> I should go. I should go diving. Make make my problems worse. But we do have one more quick story about an animal, correct, Petrina? Oh yeah, another animal for um a Florida Zoo announcing that a, uh, a Florida Zoo announcing birth of a southern white rhino. So as a zoo in Tampa, Florida has announced that the bird of a southern white rhino. This is the uh, eighth ri- white rhino born in Florida. While the state is uh, trying to plan uh, a help to help the the species, since the white rhinos are classified near as like a a near threatened because of a habitat loss and poaching of for their horns, Zoo Tampa officials at Lowry Park said that the baby was born to a 20 year old rhino that is named a lake. Last week, the female calf has not been named yet, named yet, but both baby and mother are healthy and doing well. On Saturday. The zoo posted a Facebook post that said, quote, the baby rhino appears to be strong and is nursing alongside her mother. And zoo officials have been saying that a lake was paired with the only adult male in the Tampa Zoo on Gava. The calf will be joined and join the calf will join the ca- the crash, the cash, the crash of or group of rhinos in the coming weeks. Visitors will be able to see the baby rhino. In the new expedition Wild Africa attraction, which is set to open very soon, um, I think this is so cute. Yeah. Oh, I can't, I mean, I don't. Are rhinos like a vicious species? Are they? Um, I haven't spent too much time around rhinos to confirm or deny that claim, but I don't know. I mean, I'm judging a book by its cover here. Um, and I'd say the horn is probably there for some sort of defensive measure. So I'd say they might be a little bit aggressive just yes. naturally, but I have, I don't think I've ever actually seen a real rhino in my life. Yeah. So I can't say that for certainty, but it's very not like, cause that you said they're doing this to help like the population that's very, has depleted over time. And no, I think that's very good because it's not just they're not just burning animals for people's amusement and just yeah. for people can come and see them. They're doing this to help out this species that's very close to dying off. They're trying to get those numbers uh, of population back. And that's very nice. Uh, yeah, very I know. Wholesome. It is very like refreshing to hear that they're actually like trying to save these animals. I know, I mean, there are some animals that are extincting that are expected to extinct soon. Right. It's quite sad. And I, it's nice to see that at least one species that is kind of not like lasting long, I guess they're trying to like expand its, it's like, you know, existence. Yeah. And exactly. I hope, I hope it all works out for the white rhinos. Right. Yeah. And I'm laughing. No, go ahead. Oh, I was saying I'm laughing because I had I had to Google it because I am I am I'm now well versed in animals or rhinos in general. So I had to Google this. If a oh, southern white rhino is actually white, and I went on to Google and I don't see it being white. So can someone clarify that for me? <laughs> because is it white or is it just like the name I, that they get? I just looked it up. It is not white. It's it looks more like a like a gray. Um, like a if I can share rhino. my screen, if I can share my screen, okay. I will show. Yeah, I think. Just, just because I thought it was like you know a question that you know our listeners may have, like at least I that's the question I had: Is a southern wine rhino white? <laughs> and I had to Google it, and Katrina in a second will show us if it's it's not. This <laughs> it's is just a regular so- rhino. For our Facebook viewers, this is what a southern white rhinoceros looks like. And technically white is or gray is a shade or value of white. I feel like an art student. I should know that, but I don't. But 
it's not like the base white that we think of. Mm. Oh no. I mean like look, they're like a like a brownish kind of I mean in in some light they look gray, but right. you know, you we get the point. They're not right, actually yeah. white and that's what we were looking for. <laughs> we answered the unanswered. Thank you, Patrina, yeah. for clarifying that for me. Of course. And one last <laughs> thing, I think naming a group of rhinos a crash is pretty appropriate. I didn't yeah. know that until today. But I, I feel like who's ever coming up with these names, like what to call a pack of certain animals, I, who's ever doing it is doing a great job because we got crash for rhinos. We got a murder of crows. Those are the only <laughs> two I know off the top of my head. But I, I think yeah. who's ever doing it is spot on. Oh, yeah, for sure. I don't know why. It just matches. It just yeah, matches exactly. them well. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I think it, it gets, it, this is a really great story, especially for yeah. the zoo. You know, I'm I'm hoping that you know they do, kind of, long, long and longer. Yeah. Lengthen. What's the word? Lengthen this existence of white rhinos. Yeah. But you know, thank you, Kyle, for you know correcting my English. <laughs> You're good, but it's it's such a nice and wholesome story to end off on because with that we have reached the top of the hour and the end of m another. Monday Morning Buzz, Summer Edition. Thank you all so much for tuning in. The Morning Buzz will be back tomorrow with new stories and new host. Until then, stay awesome and have a great day here on 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair.